Well, good morning. This is the Lou Rockwell Show, and it's great to have as our guest this morning, Tess Pennington. Tess is one of the most prominent prepper writers and bloggers. Take a look at her archive on lourockwell.com about preparing for disasters, whether they're man-made, government-made, or natural disasters. Tess, first of all, tell us, how, how did you get interested in all this? The first job I had out of college, I was working at the Red Cross as a, a military caseworker. And six months after I'd started working there, 9-11 happened. And I actually, uh, my chapter became the um, national headquarters for dealing with that aftermath. So, you know, I kind of shifted my job and started taking health and welfare inquiries from uh, a lot of very frightened people. And it really kind of brought to light how unprepared we were as a society. And, you know, listening to these frightened parents, I just kind of realized that a lot like a lot of people in our civilization that, you know, we're not as prepared as we should have been. So uh, I really started taking some steps back then. And then once I had children and started my family, I realized how prepared, how much more prepared we needed to be. So that's when I started uh, spring foods and uh, researching the different types of things that we need to not just survive, but thrive. So um, it's been going on, I guess, for over two, 10 years, but uh, it's just a passion for me, and, and I want to share it with everyone that I can. Tess, you know, you would think that people who are self-reliant, self-responsible, prepared for the future, would be considered good citizens. But instead, of course, they're demonized, stigmatized by the government, by the major media, by the whole regime as really dangerous people. Why do you think that is? Well, it's simple that it's very simple um, sensationalism sells, you know, and anything that's deemed different or eccentric is, you know, people stigmatize it. You know, I myself, I'm a very normal person. I you know, go about my business, I pay my taxes, Um, you know, I take my kids to school, all the normal things that everyone else does, but I just want to prepare. And um, a lot of people who, a few people that I've told, they don't understand that. They think it's strange, you know, and it is what it is. I don't really need their um, opinions, but, um, you know, it's, it's just People think that it's different and they don't understand. But, you know, I think from a a prepper point of view, you know, we want to be ready before anything happens. And typically in America, we're really a bunch of procrastinators and we wait to the last minute. And um, a lot of us have decided that we don't want to be caught off guard anymore. And, you know, when you're prepared, you're already ahead of the game. Your mind is in the game. And you don't have to worry about your survival needs. You already have that taken care of. Now you need to make sure that your family's safe and, you know, start those contingency plans that you've already prepared for. I guess to uh, uh, be a good little person, you're supposed to just turn yourself over to FEMA or whoever, whatever, in case of disaster and not prepare. And if you are not leaving everything up to FEMA and, and, and other uh, federal and state and local agencies, then there's something wrong with you. You're a dissident. You, uh, you're, you have a you're sort of casting a vote of no confidence in the, the federal prepa- so-called preparedness agencies. It, it's really, it's such a strange um, thought to even want to give myself up and, and my um, children's needs up to a government agency. It just, that's so strange to me. But, you know, it happens more cases than not. I was doing an interview with someone from um, an international newspaper, and I asked them, you know, why they were interested in this. And they, again, like we had just talked about, thought it was so strange that, you know, preppers were doing this because the government's supposed to take care of you. And, you know, that just sends shivers up my spine because I don't need the government to take care of me. I can take care of myself. You know, I have the means to do so, and I will. You know, but it's so many people kind of live in their own little bubble. They don't realize that, you know, bad things happen to people every single day all around the world. Disasters happen every day all around the world. And your bubble's going to pop one day and you're not going to know what to do. So I guess it's all in the mindset, but I myself do not want my family 
you know, being cared for in a Superdome or in a FEMA camp because I, if you do enough research, you realize um, how dangerous those types of places can be. So No, and of course, the government is, as always, since it's, you know, among the other things about it, it's a monopoly. It hates any competition. And I can remember when FEMA showed up in my town after a, a hurricane, the mm-hmm. first thing they did was to outlaw any private help. I mean, anybody who mm-hmm. was helping clean up other people's yards and uh, cut up uh, fallen trees and that sort of thing were banned. And as we know, in the whole Katrina disaster, they put a tremendous amount of effort into blocking private parties from coming in and helping people who had been uh, devastated yeah. by the hurricane. They hate they just want everything done in their uh, sort of militaristic, top-down, you obey orders, you shut up, and uh, just do what we say kind of thing. And as you note, of course, uh, as we know, whether we're looking at socialism or the uh, Superdome or anything el- or anything in between, the government doesn't do a good job of really anything. Well, I think they they have to do it. You know, they they try and, you know market it that they're taking care of the people. But, you know, really when you look at it and you're going through it, they're not really doing so well. I mean, think about, let's go to the Superdome. You know, they grouped a bunch of people in there who for, you know, a week or two didn't have their basic needs met. So you're stuck in a place with thousands of people, you know, peeing on themselves. You know, the sanitation is horrible. They're living in deplorable conditions. And violence breaks out. Rapes happen. You know, do I want to be in a place like that? No. Were they prepared for it? Absolutely not. And I think that, you know, like I said, a lot of people have seen these examples of the government coming in and trying to take care of, you know, its people. And what does it amount to? An absolute crazy frenzy, you know? So, it's it, it's really strange that people just want to kind of sit back and, you know, enjoy the good life and, you know, not really think about what bad things can actually happen, but they actually do. And you have to be realistic and know which emergencies actually um, you could come in contact with and prepare accordingly for them. It only makes sense. Well, Tess, if somebody's listening to this and they think that uh, really they don't want to be left to the tender mercies of the U.S. of FEMA, right. that they'd like to prepare, uh, but maybe they haven't started or maybe they've thought about it, they haven't actually done anything, how would you advise them to, you know, what should they read? They should read your articles and they can read those on LouRockwell.com. What else should they read? What should they do? How do they start? Uh, really, you know, that's a big it question. On, it, 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 it is. It's a very loaded question, but it, it's really dependent upon how far you want to prepare for. You know, if you, the best thing to do is start with a three day supply of food and water and supplies and go from there. You know, but really what, what I've been trying to get across to my readers is you want to, it's important to have food stored away, but you want to be smart about what you store. So you want to research, you know, which foods are best, how long you store for, you know, the proper uh, storage environment, um, how they can help your body, and all of that can give you a reliable food supply. You know, we started with um, probably about a two-week supply of canned goods, and, you know, that's just one of those prepper mistakes that you make. But, um Upon further research, we realized that, you know, you need to take in um, fats into account and carbohydrates and proteins and vitamins. And, you know, you can really start, if you really want to start becoming more self-reliant, you can find ways to get those, you know, essential food sources and get them in um, fresh sources. So, like, dehydrating fruits and vegetables and uh, storing wheat and rice and beans and that sort of thing. So, you know, do some research, you know, start trying to incorporate the same types of foods that you have in your diet, but start finding ways that you can store them for short and long-term use. So you can find that information at my website, but, you know, it, it's it's everywhere. And uh, g- give us your website. Uh, readynutrition.com. You don't want to go down to... to- the local big box store and buy a bunch of canned vegetables, in other words. That's not the way to start. No, it's good to have some canned goods. I mean, I I love storing up uh, canned meats because they're a good source of protein. Uh, But, 
you know, the fruits can be loaded with corn syrup. So, you know, you can find some low-cost ways to preserve them. And for me, I found my favorite thing that I use is a food dehydrator, and I dehydrate um, all the fruits that my kids have decided they don't want to eat anymore, so I'll dry them out and either use them for later or they, you know, eat them up as a snack, you know, or you can make beef jerky, you know. And, and having these tools, these preservation tools, uh, can also help if you find yourself, you know, looking, you know, right in the face of a disaster, and you can start preserving your foods so that, you know, they don't go bad. So, you know, these are these are all really great ways to um, be self-reliant, you know, but the canned goods is good, but, you know, you definitely want dry goods. Um, you know, you, you want to be able to eat what you store and, um, you know, just keep your diet as normal as possible. Is it an, important to rotate things, or so I've heard? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you like I said, you want to eat what you store, so you know you you create this food pantry, and you know stocking the foods up that you regularly eat, and you just go in and you you grab what you need, and you just go to the store the next time and uh, you know replace it. So we've been when we first started our food pantry, I think it was probably about four years ago, right when the real estate bubble burst, and you know we had done flour and rice and all that, and I'm still living off of that. So, you know, a lot of the food, incre- the prices of food, you know, I haven't really felt that as badly as some people have because we had all that stored up. So, you know, it really does pay off in the long run because you never know, you know, it's not just natural disasters that you're preparing for. It's, you know, it could be a loss of a job or a loss of an income, you know, and it, it really helps you out. So that's why I'm such an advocate for it. How do you store water? In glass bottles? Or what's, the, what's the method? There's a, a few different methods. Um, we've got water stored up. You can buy them in the jugs. Um, those last for probably about two years. Um, you can also take old soda bottles and wash them out really, really well and store your uh, water in there also. Uh, another thing... You know, we have that stored up, but we also wanted to have some long-term uh, water storage methods. So, you know, we've got a water uh, filtration system. We've got uh, some travel filtration systems that we have in our bug-out bags. And then we also uh, have a, a still that you can distill water from also if need be. So, you know, water is extremely important. You know, you mentioned cost and how this is this has helped you avoid some of the some of the credible food and price increases we've seen recently. But how, how much does it cost to be a prepper? I mean, that's a that's you know obviously uh, how high is up, but and it depends on how much you're how you know for how long you're storing stuff and how much you want to have stored. But is it more expensive than just the way most people regularly live, or is it actually maybe less expensive? I would say that it's less expensive. You're buying in bulk, so you know you're really saving you know, lots of money in that sense just by, you know, repackaging the uh, bulk supplies and putting them into your pantry. One, you're saving gas, not having to go to the store, but you're also saving, you know, on all of these, you know, the price inflation that's going on and uh, you just have it there. So it's it's also a, uh, it's a peace of mind um, that you get too. So, you know, it's really dependent upon, you know, how far, you want to go with this. You know, we take out money each month for our preps. You know, our our food storage is pretty good, so we've been working on uh, acquiring, you know, preparedness tools and and that sort right now. But, you know, really the initial cost, I mean, you know, I I tell my readers if they want to take 10% out of their check, you know, and just put that money towards preparedness, then, you know, go for it. But, you know, you definitely don't want to break the bank when you're preparing. You want to be as uh, fiscally responsible as possible. So, you know, just go for it and do what's within your means and just acquire a little bit at a time because, you know, over, you know, X amount of months or years, you're going to have a a lot more than what others do. Tessa? Are there uh, two or three books you can recommend that uh, people might want to read if they're interested in this, or even if they're already doing it but they want to learn more? One of my favorite books is um, 
by Carla Emery. It's the Encyclopedia of Country Living, and she's really, I mean, it's a huge resource, and she's laid out so much information on homesteading, and I, I really love that. Another thing is uh, when I started my um, garden, I was having some problems getting things established, and um, let's see, I'm looking at my library right now. <laughs> Um, it's the Garden Bible, and I absolutely just learned so much from from that. So um, let's see. And another one of my favorite books that I really turn to a lot is um, by James Wesley Rawls. It's How to Survive the End of the World as We Know It. I love this book. It's full of so, so many resources, and he's provided websites and information. So that would be another great resource to have also. Well, Tess Pennington, thanks for... Alerting as many people as you do, of course, we'll link to your website, readynutrition.com, and uh, people should take a look at also your archive on the Rockwell. Great to have you on. Thanks for all you're doing. Thank you. Sounding the signal, the uh, the alert bell to the American <laughs> people. And of course, this is all very valuable, too, in case there's economic trouble, which we know is also all too possible, more than the economic trouble they're already giving us. So, Tess, thanks for coming on the show, and thanks for all you're doing, and keep it up. Thank you. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, thanks so much for listening to The Lou Rockwell Show today. Take a look at all the podcasts. There have been hundreds of them. There's a link on the upper right-hand corner of the LRC front page. Thank you. Thank you.